mental babysitter. My day started out pretty normal. I was a 10 year old at the peak of my life with my Game Boy in one hand and cherry Kool-Aid in another. My parents were going to be out of town for a week and for the first time I was going to have to be a babysitter watching over me instead of a family member. Her name was Kimmy, a curly haired brunette with the palest completion I'd ever seen. Her face was beautiful, covered in light freckles and cherry lips. She was curvy in all the right places and I mean she actually pulled my young eyes out of the my game and onto her. Her voice was soft and her smile sweet as my parents interviewed her. Her eyes flickered over me while she was talking, making me blush and smile. She asked me questions, seeming more interested the more I spoke. I didn't mind that at all. Her eyes were most unusual shade of hazel green with one blue crescent shape placed at the side of her iris as if the green in her eye slipped and showed the blue underneath. Needless to say, she was hired on the spot and was told to come back tomorrow night. I was ecstatic about it. Six days with a beautiful girl that was interested in video games? Every ten-year-old's dream. She arrived and wished my parents well as they took off down the road and closed the door behind her. She leaned against the door and sighed slightly, closing her eyes, then beamed them right at me. Her smile disappeared and cold look spread all over her face. You gotta go upstairs and play video games. I'm gonna fix your dinner, she said. I had no reason to refuse, but something about the tone of her voice gave me the chills. I did as I was told and I played Banjo-Kazooie until she called me. Her smile was pasted back on and with a forced cheer declared that the dinner was ready. She placed a huge plate of spaghetti in front of me and I started chowing it down. That's when I heard a crunch. A sharp pain filled my mouth and I spat the noodles clear to the other side of the table. I looked down in the puddle of blood and picked up the small piece of glass. Her smile disappeared and worry filled her eyes. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I broke a glass earlier and didn't think it got to the counter. My mouth tasted of iron and I choked back tears. Kimmy covered her mouth and looked down in shame, taking away my dinner and excusing herself to the other room. I made cereal. I was happy for it, but the cold milk soothed my sensitive gums. I went to bed early that night as Kimmy was watching a horrible video on repeat. It was of a man in a ram mask telling everyone they were going to hell and how all the innocent people would just be a kindling for the fire. She had a video as loud as it could go and replayed it for over three hours. She even started memorizing parts and chanting along with this man. I, I locked my door and tried to occupy my mind with TV until I was tired enough to go to bed. Even then, I moved my blankets into the closet and sat there with all my stuffed animals and toys. In the morning, I was shaken away by Kimmy. My heart stopped as I saw my door lined with a long gash and footprints and doorknobs laying in the middle of my room. She smiled as she chimed a good morning and set a big plate of eggs and toast by my side, made with love. She smiled and ruffled my hair. My eyes grew wide as she walked out of my room, running her now red stub fingers across my destroyed door, streaking the white paint and glossy red slime. I picked up the egg on my fork and noticed the gray dust lining on my plate. What is that? It, it was everywhere, scattered through the eggs and even on my toast. I decided not to eat it since it just didn't look right to me. I dumped my plate into the trash and made my way downstairs. Kimmy was cleaning up in the kitchen and humming a dull tune to herself. What, what was that gray dust in my egg, I asked. She shrugged and nodded her head in a vague direction of the kitchen. Some spice that I found, she answered. I looked into the direction and only saw a shelf mom kept her things like trinkets, glassware, and vases. But I stopped and noticed a certain vase was out of place. It was my grandma's urns. Fear struck me and I knew I needed to call my parents, tell them to save me. As if Kim read my mind, 
She pointed to the home phone and dully said, The phone's out. Not sure what happened. I look into the wall and now saw the split wires hanging from the wall in a bare circuit that that we used to even call it a phone. <laughs> I nodded nervously and backed away out of the out of the kitchen. Kim staring at me with a smug grin on her face. Then I fully sprinted to the front door and didn't even get a lock undone before Kimmy smashed into me, crushing my face into the hardwood and hearing my hand that was around the doorknob crack. Not sure how long I was out, maybe a few hours, or even a day. I woke up in the laundry room, the only room in the house that didn't have any windows. I looked around and the only thing that stood out to me was that I was duct taped to the washer and a big bag moving near the wall. I listened for Kimmy but didn't hear anything. Had she left me here for dead? The moving bag caught my attention again. Crying rang out and caught my heart in my throat. That, that was our family dog, stuffed into a bag. Why was she in the bag? She was almost 10 years old, didn't even bark at strangers, and was about the sweetest dog you will ever meet. Tears swelled up as her crying grew louder and she struggled to free herself. Then I heard the front door open. It had been about maybe around three hours, I don't really know, since I last woke up and the only thing that I managed to do is rub my skin on the tape and cry. Kimmy opened the door a little bit and slowly peeked her head in. Her smile grew and she saw the fear in my eyes. Please, I begged, let the dog go. She didn't do anything. Call my parents. We can talk about it. She slammed the door shut behind her, making me jump and cower in fear. And then, what she was holding in her hand was a baseball bat. My legs shook as she eyed the bag and smiled. This dog will be okay because she's innocent. Innocent, she said, with the happiness in her voice. She then rapidly raised the bed and brought it down onto the bag over and over again. The dog then died quickly, each swing bringing a yelp and shaking and cry for me. Fifteen, sixteen. Seventeen swings. It was like she was never gonna stop. I lost count around fifty and the desperate yelping stopped around eighty. The look in her eyes was wild. Her face looked like it would tear if she smiled any more. She stopped panting and looking at the bag, which was now a lump of blood and bone. Picking up the bag and looking back at me, she said, Now don't go anywhere and closed the door behind her. I was in despair. My beloved dog was beaten to death and I couldn't do anything to stop it. Her yelping was still ringing in my ears and the image of her broken body being dragged away was forever haunting my memories. I was there for another hour before I started hearing loud noises coming from the front door. Then a lot of yelling when the door was broken down. Kimmy called the police and committed suicide after doing some creative work with all she had. She poured my dog's blood into the glass and mixed it in with the cherry Kool-Aid and colored the living room with the blood decredit pentagrams and signs of Satan. She strung the dog's intestines from the ceiling fan and then turned it on so the blood went everywhere. My grandma's ashes were scattered across the house in the dog's food bowl, fish tank, and even my parents' bed. Kim was found outside. She took a running jump out the window and landed on an old Victorian fence. I was taken to the hospital and treated for a broken hand and wrist. My parents were called and in less than two days we moved out of that house and into another city. Of course I was forced into a therapy and spent years sorting out my feelings. They believed that it was all cult related and she did all these horrible things to please the cult. It was in every newspaper and everybody in town knew what happened at that house. To this day, I haven't gone back to that house, nor will I ever will.